Hi, welcome you all to the sixth episode of the Curiosity, the weekly science program, summing up the developments in the week number 23 of 2020. So this week's episode features stories across the disciplines, including preventing COVID-19's second wave, you know, and hobby depression connection, anesthesia, negative thoughts, Mayan civilization, extreme political protests, and so on, plus observances in the next week and opportunities for the students. So please stay tuned and keep watching. So the first story of the week is all about a Slovenian study that has been published in the, the journal called the Psychology, Health and Medicine. A, 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 an interesting study. The title of the study is a Modeling Compliance with COVID-19 Prevention Guidelines, the Critical Role of Trust in Science. And the study included 525 uh, subjects or cohorts. And the main conclusions of the study is that in spite of the World Health Organization and government guidelines on physical distancing and the use of masks, there have been numerous reports and instances of the people ignoring these instructions all around the world, likely exacerbating the problem. So there is a background of the study. And the study found that the COVID-19 risk perception and the trust in science independently predict the compliance with COVID-19 prevention guidelines. So it's a very significant uh, finding. So the trust in science is a very important determinant of the compliance. What does that mean? If the people who trust in science tend to follow the government regulations, you know, the, the, the government is prescribing to wear the mask in public places and maintain the physical distancing of two meter. So those people who trust in science and scientists do care of, of that. And those people who don't have the trust in science uh, tend to be neglecting all these government regulations. So it's a very important, uh, you know, the, the study. So the trust in science explains different levels of compliance with COVID-19 prevention guideline. And the study's quote is that it is important to take steps towards improving the level of public trust in science and scientists. So it's, it's extremely important. And uh, the study uh, also gave few tips on improving the public trust in science. So the, the tips included rapidly responding to real life issues rather than simply, you know, so-called uh, philosophical armchair preaching and simply publishing trash papers without any uh, you know the uh, significance impact on the public health or public life or the curiosity you know it doesn't actually pick the curiosity just uh, mediocrity uh, publishing you know those kind of findings so there is no point in that and actively participating in public discussions by providing facts in a way that is easily understood by the public so it's all about outreach activities you know and um, uh, public sensitization and uh, you know you're you're actually promoting the communicating the uh, the science to the public in an understandable manner devoid of the jargons and technical words and informing the public about the key aspects of the scientific process so what is the scientific methodology what is the science how science works all these matters are important the public should know uh, at least how the science works and promoting the ethical and transparent research practices within the scientific community is very important because uh, the public lose interest in science and distrust the scientist or because of this uh, uh, you know the, the uh, loose in transparency so uh, people who actually fabricate the data is actually harming the, the the trust in science the public trust in science so all these tips are really important and that is why i like this paper a lot because the trust in science is a determinant of the compliance with the government regulations. Our second story of the week is from a department of plant sciences in University of Cambridge published in a very famous journal called uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society A. A is concerned with mathematical, physical and engineering sciences while uh, this uh, B is concerned with the biological sciences published by the Royal Society of London. And uh, the title of the paper is Modeling Framework to Assess the Likely Effectiveness of the Face Masks in combination with the lockdown in managing COVID-19 pandemic. So the study assessed that is the, you know, the, the face mask as well as co uh, the lockdown approaches are really effective or not. It's very interesting to note that the, the study is on the epidemiology, but the people, uh, you know, the, the faculty who publish are from the Department of Plant Sciences. It's just like in the case of me, I'm also from uh, Department of Botany, but I talk a lot on the COVID-19 epidemiology. So this, uh, you know, th this uh, uh, close talk between the subject and discipline so it's like a free bird a zoomed out perspective or interconnectedness I like it a lot you know so this uh, this is one of the interesting aspects of this study and uh, so this study what they conclude is that the face mask use 
needed to prevent the COVID-19 second wave. It's a very significant uh, study. So uh, we are on, or talking about the second wave here in India. So the, the uh, you know, the COVID-19 situation is not that very nice here in India. Uh, things are getting really, you know, it's not improving at least. And it's, uh, you know, the, the situation is something same as the uh, past few months. And uh, of course, we we did have government did a good job by insisting for the lockdown as well as uh, uh, the face mask. Uh, but still, many people don't follow the government regulations. So that is the main problem here. So as in Brazil, Brazil, the situation is getting really worse. So that the second wave of infection is a very prominent issue being talked in most of the developing as even the developed countries like in Sweden, where the lockdown was more or less uh, you know, not so efficiently implemented in Sweden. So according to this study, 100% uh, you know, the, the mask adoption combined with on-off lockdown prevented any further disease resurgence for 18 months required for the possible vaccine. So before the vaccine is being developed, so we really need 100% uh, face adoption plus uh, you know, on and off lockdown and physical distancing. All these measures are needed to prevent uh, the second wave attack of the COVID-19. So it's a very significant finding by the Cambridge University scientists. So uh, one quote from the paper is that these analysis may explain why some countries where adoption of the face mask used by the public is around 100 percentage have experienced significantly lower rates of COVID-19 spread and associated deaths. So the countries uh, included uh, you know the New Zealand and Germany and uh, uh, you know the Japan and South Korea these countries really did implemented the face mask you know and uh, they actually found a great reduction in the community transmission of the COVID-19 so this is the only option left for us as well so we really have to follow the government regulations Another quote from the paper is that we conclude that the face mask used by the public when used in combination with physical distancing or periods of lockdown may provide an acceptable way of managing COVID-19 pandemic and reopening economic activity. So to reopen economic activity, this is a plausible solution, you know, to insisting on the, the, the face mask use. Of course, uh, economic activity reopening is extremely relevant issue because a lot of uh, unorganized sectors, uh, you know, for example, the migrant workers, they are actually losing out a lot. The, the, they don't have any job. And uh, of course, the poverty is on rise everywhere in the world. So we really have to ensure a proper job for them as well, you know, the, the unorganized sector. So opening up the economic uh, activity is extremely relevant, so as preventing the second wave of the COVID-19. So a key message from our analysis is to aid the widespread adoption of face masks would be my mask protects you, your mask protects me. This is a quote from that paper. So this is my favorite quote as well. I have actually produced a number of videos on the face mask and why face masks are really important. So please have a look on my videos linked up in, uh, in, the, in the details page of this video. So uh, the advice is that always wear mask in public. So wherever you go in public places, always wear mask because mask is a part of the normal etiquettes uh, post COVID-19 era. And I recently flabbergasted by looking at so many messages spreading in the, the Facebook and this is by one of my uh, old student and I'm really shocked to see that this, uh, these kind of messages are being spread everywhere. This is nothing but a communist propaganda, you know, the, the people who are actually claiming to be communists are pr propagating these kind of myths. So, you know, for example, if you l read it carefully, wearing mark is highly dangerous. No, it is not dangerous at all because, uh, you know, hypercapnia, I have debunked this myth in one of my previous video so please have a look on the hypercapnia myth second one is us stop using alcohol based chemical sanitizer friends are sanitizer gonna high quality high quantity of alcohol uh, chemical highly dangerous for health no it is not dangerous because you are not consuming it right it's only for the hands so it is not that dangerous so it is not and the third one is about the lockdown is also highly dangerous and so and so so now this kind of propaganda please distrust trust only in science so uh, you know the even the communist countries friends look at the the case in China China is a communist country they are insisting the mask right the Cuba is a communist country uh, are, are there no lockdown in Cuba or uh, the, you know the face mask no 
Cuba is a communist country and they do have trust on science. You know, Russia is a communist country. Russia do trust on science. So as, uh, you know, Vietnam or China, I mean, you look anywhere, you know, so they distrust this communist propaganda and uh, stop trusting on this propaganda messages and trust only in the, the scientific advisory. Even WHO, people are making, mocking fun of World Health Organization. No. World Health Organization is also a respected organization trust on WHO's guidelines. The third story of the week is from American Academy of Dermatology. It's a very interesting study and uh, this is by a team from US and Spain and the title of the paper is Androgenetic Alopecia Present in Majority of Hospitalized COVID-19 Patients the Gabrin sign very interesting paper so what is this uh, androgenetic alopecia that is nothing but male pattern baldness so bald men may be at higher risk of severe COVID-19 symptoms that is what the, the study's conclusion in one line so the study suggests that the link is so strong that the baldness should be considered as a risk factor called Gabrin sign after the first physician to die of the coronavirus in the US, Dr. Frank Gabrin, who was bald. You know, so there is a very interesting link. So maybe uh, a strong risk factor if you have patent baldness. So the bald men, beware. Even bald women as well, beware uh, to always to wear uh, the face mask when you go out because you are at a high risk of uh, contracting COVID-19. Yet another risk to wear the mask. So the, the study is basically the gap in sign because this is a, uh, uh, you know, respected American physician who died of COVID-19. He was also a bald, you know, the, the he had a, a male pattern baldness so this is the graphic summary of the study as you can see among the COVID-19 people who got at, at, uh, you know hospitalized with severe COVID-19 uh, you know the the disease 42 percentage of the female as well as 79 percent of the male were bald so it is the the, the you know association is very strong our next story of the week is by a Canadian team and this is published in a journal Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. So the, it's about a psychology story. And the title of this one is The Activist Dilemma. Extreme protest actions reduced popular support for social movements. So as you might know that there are a lot of social, uh, you know, uh, protests are going on all around the world now. Black Lives Matter in the US, for example, or Germany uh, and entire Europe uh, against the COVID-19 lockdown, isn't it? So this study analyzed 3,399 people on a questionnaire survey and the research finds that extreme protest actions reduce popular support for social movements. So, you know, to increase the support for social movement, don't go for the extreme uh, protest. So that is very interesting finding. So extreme behavior such as use of inflammatory rhetoric, that is the language, blocking the traffic and vandalism, that is destroying the public property, consistently reduced, uh, uh, resulted in reduced support for the social movements. So here is a quote from the study by alienating both neutral observers and supporters. So uh, observers and supporters who are neutral yet not yet decided uh, to support or not, they will actually go against the, the cause if they find that, uh, you know, the, 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 the people are actually vandalizing the public property and they become really extreme. So uh, that's a very interesting study. A quote from the paper is that we found extreme anti-Trump protest actions actually led people to not only dislike the movement and also support the cause less, but also willing to support the Trump more. You see, it's, it's actually having a, an opposite. It's like a cobra effect. You know, it was almost like a backlash. So very interesting finding. Our next paper, the fifth study of the week or the fifth story of the week is uh, by a Danish and US team. And this is published in a journal called Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin. And the, the title of the paper is Narcissism in Political Participation. And as you know, the word meaning narcissism is that exceptional interest in uh, admiration for yourself. So self-love, that is narcissism, right? So if you love yourself a lot, then chances are high that you are uh, likely to vote and you are politically inclined. That is, uh, that's very interesting. Fine, I like it, uh, this study. So that is why I picked this study. So three studies in the United States and Denmark find that those scoring higher in narcissism participate more in politics, including contacting politicians, signing the petitions and joining demonstrations, donating the money and voting in midterm elections. So all these are the hallmarks of political participation. 
and the study found that the superiority and authority or leadership were positively related to the participation while self-sufficiency was negatively related to the participation. So these are some of the hallmark of the narcissistic personality trait. They are superiority and authority or leadership uh, qualities. So those are actually positive thing. And also of course uh, self-sufficiency is also a positive attribute but self-sufficiency is negatively related. That means that if you feel yourself as self-sufficient then you are less likely to participate in political affairs but the reverse is not true so don't conclude that uh, everyone interested in politics is a narcissist so that is not the conclusion so narcissist people are more likely to be uh, you know participating in politics so, uh, the reverse is not true so that is what the, the study is so it's I think it's a very interesting study now our sixth story of the week is the uh, you know it's a, it's another uh, story from the the psychology and is published in a journal called personality and individual differences and the title of the story is that borderline personality traits in attractive women and wealthy low attractive men are relatively favored by the opposite sex it's very interesting studies about the dating and it's by a uk team and uh, the study involved 525 participants so as you know the borderline personality traits have got the you know this is something called the, the the dark triad trait so what this triad of the dark triad traits all these are negative connotations so that is why it is some a hallmark with psychopathy that is impulsive emotionally cold remorseless uh, you know the example body language could be inappropriate or lack of emotional expression then narcissism which we just explained in the previous story that, that is grandiosity perceived superiority and entitlement so example of the body language are first person pronouns focus on self in conversation so these are the examples of the narcissism and machiavellianism so these are the, the traits are manipulative self-interested domineering example body language involved dominant and expansive posture so all these are dark uh, you know the triad so the study analyzed adaptive characteristic of the dark triad traits that just i just explained what these dark triad traits are and how they might be appealing in a romantic partner it's very interesting to see that uh, the study found that men are drawn to the borderline personality traits that is uh, you know the, the dark triad traits in the physically attractive woman so that is very interesting though the, you know the, the women of course the women uh, who are am, among the uh, the women who are physically attractive uh, you know that the men do prefer the women with the borderline personality disorders basically they are psychopaths and uh, of course that the, the finding is something like reverse of the familiar notion of the women being attracted to the bad boys you know so even though it is evident that the boy is bad for them so uh, evolutionally or uh, adaptation if you speak of uh, then the, there is no point that the women are attracted to the bad boys they are untrustworthy but still and they have a lot of risk you know and they actually commit themselves in danger so it is not really evolutionally you won't expect any uh, uh, you know fitness right on those boys but still the women are attracted to the bad boys so that is a, a common saying maybe it's true as well so this is the reverse is also true that is what the study uh, found so one quote from this the, the paper is that however the upside of this instability is that these individuals might be exciting to be with in terms of sensation seeking and being impulsive so that means the studies said that those ladies with personality borderline personality traits or the, the dark triads have sensation seeking and being impulsive so those are some of the good characteristic of uh, those psychopaths so that is the reason why the men are more attracted to that kind of women next story of the week the seventh story is by a uk team from university college london and it's a systematic review published in the journal alzheimer's and dementia a very interesting paper and the title of the paper is a repetitive negative thinking is associated with amyloid tau and cognitive decline so that is a very interesting paper so in this paper you can see that repetitive negative thinking is associated with amyloid tau and cognitive decline that is the paper's name so uh, th this is a statement from the paper rnt that is repetitive negative thinking was associated with decline in global cognition 
where the p is 0 0.02 that is uh, uh, the statistical significance you know so 0 0.02 means quite highly significant that uh, if you have this repeated thoughts then cognition uh, the overall um, uh, you know the, the fitness of your mentality that the brain function is uh, pretty low so if you have uh, repetitive negative thoughts then you are on a higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and uh, uh, you know the, the immediate and delayed memory so immediate memory it is a little bit higher but still it's significant 0 0.03 and delayed memory it is pretty borderline 0 0.04 you know the p-value the cutoff is 0 0.05 that is 95 percentage chance so that is uh, the normal uh, level right so that we we call it as 95 percentage so it is 0 0.05 is a cutoff in the probability so it is a statistical term so that means that if p-value is 0 0.05 or near to 0 0.05 then it's not that significant so delayed memory i won't say it's that significant but immediate memory is significantly associated so if you have uh, you know uh, repeated negative thought then your immediate memory uh, is being affected uh, significantly and global amyloid prevention is very low uh, p-value so it's highly significant and uh, you know entorhinal tau is also significant deposition so relationship remained after adjusting for the potential confounders so the study did a good job to see the confounding factors as well so psychological risk for the Alzheimer's disease or AD often involve repetitive negative thinking R and T. So the study is quite interesting that if you have the repetitive uh, negative thinking, so you know you are at a high risk for uh, developing the uh, you know the Alzheimer's disease. So better you practice meditation and uh, go for a walk, listen to music, uh, do activities that actually get you out of this. Uh, you know uh, the repetitive negative thinking so if you believe in god go for the religious congregation no problem at all so uh, having negative thought is really dangerous so that is what the the, the study concludes our eighth story of the week is again from the UCL, the UK team. They did a, a study involving 8,780 adults and it is a longitudinal study involving 14 years. It's a very long study and the study is published in a journal called Psychotherapy and Psychosomatics and the title of the study is that Fixed Effects Analysis of Time Varying Associations Between Hobbies and Depression in Longitudinal Cohort Study support for social prescribing very interesting title and very interesting study so the study concluded you know i like to summarize the study in one line so just one line summary of this study is that taking up a hobby may help stave off the depression so if you simply take up any hobby so that will help you to, to come out of the depression so it's a very very uh, important conclusion so that is why i picked up this story for this week's curiosity so for those who had depression and no hobby Taking up one was linked with improvement in depression symptoms and 272 percentage higher chance of recovering from that depression. So it's extremely important study and the conclusion is very relevant. Positive findings were independent of any social interaction with others. So it is not connected with the social interaction. Even solitary hobbies are really important you know for example gardening uh, you can do that hobby yourself so still that will help you to improve the situation of the depression and negative thinking so researchers say that the findings support the idea of social prescribing what is a social prescribing which encourages the patients to engage in group activities that involve hobbies such as making music drawing and handicrafts such as sewing carpentry collecting or model making which can offer chances to be creative express themselves and relax so by the way the study also analyzes the solitary hobbies as well so it's immaterial is it are you going for a social hobby or a solitary hobby taking up hobby matters a lot so if you know anybody with the uh, you know the with the depression uh, if you have any relative or friends prescribe a hobby you just ask him to have take up a hobby learn a musical instrument or you know play play cards or play chess or go for a walk or you know cycling or whatever the hobby you know even the sky watching or gardening whatever a lot of hobbies are there right so you prescribe him so that in that way you are helping that person to get out of the depression so of course this study is relevant because there are a lot of issues with the mental uh, and depression in this uh, you know the, the, the pandemic so depression is on the rise now because of the, the lockdown and economic impacts of it so it's very important to prevent the, the depression and help those people who are suffering from depression so hobby might be a good answer for that.
Our ninth story of the week is about anesthesia, the general anesthesia. By the way, this is the, the picture of the week. So this is a very famous picture by uh, the, the title uh, of the picture is First Operation Under Ether. And it's by Robert C. Hinckley. Uh, and this is from uh, the Francis A. Contway Library of Medicine, Harvard Medical School. So this is a very interesting, uh, you know, the oil on canvas picture on the first surgery. It was actually done on the Massachusetts General Hospital in the early 19th century. And, uh, you know, the first general anesthesia, uh, you know, by using ether. So general anesthesia, have you ever had a surgery with general anesthesia? In my case, yes, I had a, uh, you know, the neck issue and uh, back of my neck. So got surgical, you know, the, the lump got surgically removed uh, last year and I was under general anesthesia. So it was a bizarre experience within few seconds. I totally lost consciousness, but still I can feel that my breath has completely stopped. So it's, it was really a very strange experience. So I can really feel that I'm not breathing. But I can feel, I can sense the things around me, you know, I can, I can see that my mouth is wide open and it took me a while to get back to the consciousness. So how does the anesthesia works? I'm so surprised that the science didn't have an answer to it till date. It's a long conundrum. So the ninth story of the week is by a US team from the Scripps Institution in La Jolla in California. It just published in the journal PNAS. And the title of the paper is Studies on the Mechanism of the General Anesthesia. So what I like most about the study is that, you know, I never knew that the science didn't know that uh, science had no answer how the general, general anesthesia works till date. It's a 175 year old medical mystery. You know, of course, I've covered this topic in uh, the YouTube channel as well. So, so many of the medicines that we use it, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite often, we really don't know how these medicines work. You know, we have no clue, but we have statistical evidences that it do work. So that is why we are actually using those medicines, you know. So the new study or new research done on the fruit fly using D-STORM, that is a direct stochastic optical reconstruction microscope, that is a very high resolution microscopy, shows how general anesthesia induces unconsciousness. So the study, uh, you know, on a common lang, you know, common man's perspective, the study can be concluded as a billiard-like break shot, you know, in the in the, the snooker or billiards. So uh, scatters lipid clusters in the cell membranes, which releases an enzyme that liberates the potassium from the ion channel, leaving neurons hyperpolarized and inhibiting their ability to fire. So that is what is happening when you are under the general anesthesia. So what happens is that, you know, it is something like a billiard, like the break shot. So like, just like in the billiard table, it just scatters a lipid clusters in the cell membrane. So many lipids are there on the cell membrane of the neurons on the brain. And it releases an enzyme that liberates the potassium from the ion channel. So it get you know, the, the, uh, the neurons get flooded with the potassium ions. And it gets hyperpolarized with all this potassium and inhibits the ability to fire. So that it just stops the complete, uh, you know, the, the mental processes. So that is actually what is happening. It's a very interesting way. So anesthetics directly target a subset of the plasma membrane lipids to activate uh, something called TREC1 transmembrane protein. It's an ion channel, potassium ion channel. K is potassium in two-step mechanism so that is what the study says so by the way the d storm is a very famous microscopy technique uh, for this per uh, you know for the development or invention of the d storm microscopy eric bedswin stefan w hell and uh, william e morner got nobel prize for chemistry in 2014 so that helped uh, this study also to to understand how the general anesthetics works our 10th story of the week is about the Mayan civilization, you know, in the Mexico, the olden days, in the Mayan civilization before the Inquisition, you know. So this is a reconstructed structure of the Mayan civilization, the ancient Maya ceremonial structure at Aguada Phoenix in Tabasco, Mexico. Yes, same Tabasco. You might remember uh, there is a very famous, uh, uh, the sauce, Tabasco sauce, right? So that is also from the same village in the Mexico. So this structure, uh, you know, this particular paper was published in the last week's uh, famous journal, British journal Nature. And it's by a, an American and Japanese team. And the title of the paper is Monumental Architecture at Aguada Phoenix. 
and the rise of Mayan civilization. It's a very interesting paper. So the researchers found 3000 years old Maya structure larger than uh, their pyramids. So it is a big structure. So how big was that? Yes, so the, the it is basically 1400 meter in length. So it's more than one kilometer, almost 1.5 kilometers in length and 10 to 15 meter in height and has nine causeways radiating out of it. It's wonderful discovery. And you might wonder why this remained undiscovered till date because the scientists actually discovered it using something very interesting technique called airborne laser scanning technique called LIDAR. Uh, to create the three-dimensional map of the surface below. So that technique is uh, it, it's very interesting technique that is actually recently found technique and it is now being used in many places. Even in consumer electronics, the new uh, version of the iPad Pro, the Apple iPad is coming with LiDAR sensor. You know, So LiDAR is a portmanteau word. So portmanteau is a word uh, comprised of two different words combined together agglutinated you know uh, something like motel mobile and hotel motel right so leader is actually from you know the the light and radar so that is what the leader means light and radar so radar is usually with the radio waves but it's using the light or laser based radar that is leader it's very interesting uh, new technique and a quote from the paper is to our knowledge this is the oldest monumental construction ever found in the Maya area and the largest in the entire pre-Hispanic history of the region. So Central America, Mexico is part of the Central America, right? So it's really, really interesting. So we really have a, no clue really what is really happening in that time, you know. So such an immense hole in our understanding of this part of the humanity's uh, history because uh, 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 conquerors, the Spanish invaders, they uh, destroyed almost entire South American and Central American cultures, the Mayan and Inca and Andean uh, cultures, you know. So that is actually, that is the main reason why we, we really don't have any clue for that the imperial expansion is to blame, uh, you know. So that is actually what has happened. So uh, the technique, I'm, I'm really happy that this LIDAR and other interesting techniques are actually throwing light on many interesting fac facets of archaeology, one of my favorite subjects.